Revolution. A new royal family. Intrigues and a murder. This is the story of the women who found themselves in the midst of the Vasa dynasty's turbulent family feud. In the first part, we learned about the three queens of Gustav Vasa. Katharina of Saxon-Lauenburg, the German princess, Margareta Leenhuvud, the perfect wife, and Katharina Stenbock, who was dowager queen for 61 years. In the second part, we got to know Karin Monstotter, the barmaid that became queen, Katarina Jagelonica, the Polish princess, and Gunilla Bielke, who according to legend, first turned down the offer to become Johan III's queen. In this last episode, we will learn more about the last Vasa queens, and their story is one of family feuds, power struggles, and a queen fleeing Sweden. When Johan III died on November 17, 1592, his and Katarina Jaglonica's son Sigismund became king of Sweden. He was already elected king of Poland, and he was also already married to Anna of Austria. Anna was born into the Habsburg dynasty on August 16, 1573, daughter to Archduke Karl II of Austria and Anna Maria of Bayern. Her parents had a total of 15 children, of which eight survived to adulthood. Anna and her siblings received a strict Catholic education. They would attend church since the age of one, and their first words were to be Jesus and Mary. Besides religion and Latin, Anna's education mainly focused on how to run a household and other so-called female chores, such as sewing and embroidering. When Anna was old enough to marry, a few different candidates were discussed, amongst others her cousin, the Holy Roman Emperor. But in the end, the choice fell upon the Polish king and Swedish crown prince, Sigismund. It was said Anna herself was not very happy about this, but of course, she didn't get a say. When the marriage negotiations were done, Anna and her mother, Maria Anna, traveled to Krakow, where Anna and Sigismund married on May 31, 1592, and Anna was crowned Queen of Poland. Not just Anna, but also the Polish nobility were against the marriage. They did not want an alliance with the Habsburgs, and even tried to block Anna from entering the country. But despite the resistance, the marriage has been described as happy. Anna and Sigismund got along well, and she was one of his closest advisors and a great support during the turbulent years to come. And they came when Sweden's king and Sigismund's father, Johan, died six months after the wedding. Sigismund and Anna would now become king and queen of Sweden as well. It would take until September the following year, however, before the royal couple arrived in Sweden. The reason for the delay had been that Anna was pregnant. She gave birth to a daughter, Anna Maria, on May 23, 1593. When they left Poland, the Polish nobility, who were against Sigismund leaving the country, demanded that he'd leave Anna behind as a pledge to return. Sigismund rejected this, but the couple had to leave their newborn daughter instead. So at last, in the end of September 1593, Anna and Sigismund arrived in Stockholm. Sigismund was now 27, and Anna, who was 20, was pregnant again. The arrival to Sweden was probably an unpleasant shock for them both. Sigismund found out that the Privy Council, with his uncle Karl at the head, had a lot of power. They had also made a list of demands he would have to accept, amongst other things that Sweden would remain a Protestant country and Catholics were denied freedom of religion. Once he agreed to these terms, he and Anna could be crowned King and Queen of Sweden in February 1594. The coronation ceremony was of course Protestant, and the fervently Catholic Anna felt it to be an empty ceremony lacking real value. She didn't speak the language, felt alone and harassed by the Protestant priests. She also found the castle to be dark and austere, and she accused the dowager queen Gunilla Bielke of stealing beautiful and valuable things. Anna has been described as beautiful and gracious, but reserved 
and she only participated in official ceremonies when she really had to. In April 1594, Anna gave birth to a daughter, Katarina. This was properly celebrated, but unfortunately, the child died a couple of months later. We can guess that Anna was not sorry to leave Sweden in July of the same year. The council, led by Duke Karl, would govern the country in the king's absence. Sigismund, however, did not trust them and tried to limit their power by hiring people loyal to him and he forbade the council to gather parliament without his expressed consent. That was a rule the council would not keep to, and as early as 1595 a parliament was held where Duke Karl was appointed regent in Sigismund's absence. Catholic services were banned, and it was decided that all Catholics were to be banished. Sigismund responded with declaring that since parliament had gathered unlawfully, Therefore, all decisions made there were invalid. This is when the discord between Sigismund and Uncle Karl turned to pure animosity and eventually to open conflict, of which I will tell more later. Because Anna did not live to see much of this. Back in Poland, she gave birth to two more children, Crown Prince Vladislav and another daughter, also named Katarina who unfortunately died a few months before her first birthday. Anna was pregnant again, and in February 1598 the contraction started. The birth has been described as difficult, and according to one source, the child was cut from her body, was emergency baptized, and then died. Anna died soon after, on February 10, of severe bleeding. She was only 25 years old. The conflict between Sigismund and Karl continued to escalate, and in the summer of 1598, Sigismund brought an army of 5,000 men to Sweden, where he met Karl's forces. At first, things went well for Sigismund. Many of the council members joined him, and he managed to conquer Kalmar and Stockholm. But in September, the armies clashed at Stongebro outside Linköping, and the battle ended in victory for Karl. In the negotiations that followed, Sigismund was forced to surrender the council members who stood by his side. They would later be executed in what is called the Linköping bloodbath. The following year, a parliament was held, where Sigismund was urged to return to Sweden and convert to Protestantism, or to send his son there to be raised in the Protestant faith, or else he would lose the kingship. Sigismund refused. And the next year, 1599, the parliament named Karl king. However, it took until 1604 before he himself assumed the title of king. The new queen, Karl's second wife, was named Christina of Holstein Gottorp. She was born on April 12, 1573, as the fourth of seven children to Duke Adolf of Holstein Gottorp and Christina of Hessen. Adolf was half-brother to the Danish king, and this kinship would not always be to Christina's advantage. Karl had previously been married to Maria of Fals, who died in 1589. Of their six children, only the daughter Katarina survived. When Karl wanted to remarry, his sister Elisabeth helped him find a suitable wife. She suggested Christina, who was a good candidate because of her noble birth and her Protestant faith. Christina had previously been engaged to Sigismund, but he ditched her in favor of Anna of Austria. Maybe the new couple found common ground in their loathing of Sigismund. Christina and Karl married in Nyköping on August 27, 1592, when Christina was 19 and Karl, who at this time was only a duke, was 23 years older. Christina have often gotten the blame for Karl's rebellion against Sigismund. It was supposedly she who incited him because of her bitterness towards her ex fiance She was described by her opponents as the Eve who made her husband bite the apple of kingship. If Christina really encouraged Karl to take the throne, we don't know. But it is not uncommon for powerful women in history to be vilified, and Christina was a force to be reckoned with. 
She has been described as being as harsh and stern as her husband and good with finances. It is told that she in times of crisis forced the court to eat everything that was being served, including the fish bones, and that she herself measured the fabric when something needed to be sewn so that nothing would go to waste. Carl himself admitted that they could have loud arguments, and when war broke out with Denmark, he suspected her of being too pro-Danish because of her kinship to the Danish royal family. But overall, they seemed to get along well. They had four children together, of which three survived to adulthood. The future king, Gustav II Adolf, Maria Elizabeth and Carl Philip. Carl is also said to appreciate his wife's abilities, and when he was king, she took over as regent on several occasions in his absence. He also made sure that she would lead the government in the event that he died before Gustav Adolf came of age. And died, Carl did on October 30th, 1611. Christina then became the first Vasa queen to see her child inherit the throne and the only one who took place in the Privy Council during his minority. The time as his guardian, however, was short. Sweden was at war with Russia, Denmark and Poland, whose King Sigismund still saw himself as the true king of Sweden. Christina must have realized that Sweden needed a unifying figure, someone who could save the country from disaster. She convened a parliament in which she successfully argued that her son Gustav Adolf would come of age at the age of 17. He ascended the throne on December 26, barely two months after his father's death. This, however, did not mean that Christina faded into the background. She continued to have a big influence over politics and over her children. Her youngest son, Carl Philip, was still underage, and she was appointed guardian over his duchy, which consisted of Södermanland, Närke and Värmland. There, she ruled after her own devices, since the dukedom was almost like a state within the state, where the economy flourished in a way it didn't in the rest of the country. But Christina often clashed with Gustav II Adolf about the autonomy of the duchy. He wanted to centralize power, while she wanted as much independence as possible. Carl Philip was her favorite son, and when he was considered to be elected king over Russia, Christina delayed the process for so long that when the prince eventually left for his new kingdom, the Romanov dynasty had taken power. Carl Philip had to be content with his duchy, which Christina continued to rule. She also continued to rule her children. Gustav Adolf had fallen in love with a noble lady at court, Ebba Brahe. He wanted to marry her, but Christina refused to agree since she wanted an alliance with some German principality. She also considered it more trouble than it was worth to marry into the Swedish nobility, and maybe she didn't think Ebba was quite good enough for her son. So Gustav Adolf gave up. Ebba was sent from court, and the search began for a proper bride for the king. Again, Christina held reins. She had found a perfect candidate, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. We will come back to her later. Christina also forced the marriage between her daughter Maria Elisabeth and the Duke Johan of Östergötland, who was the youngest son to Johan III and thus Maria Elisabeth's cousin. The church strongly opposed the marriage between cousins, but Christina didn't care and the wedding went ahead. The marriage turned out to be a very unhappy one. Maria Elizabeth suffered from mental illness and possibly epilepsy and died 1618, only 22 years old. Christina's favorite son also died young. Carl Philip participated in the battles with Russia and died in January 1622, 20 years old. He had in secret married Elizabeth Ribbing and they had a daughter together, also named Elizabeth. Carl Philip's death ended the conflict between Christina and the king about the duchy, which reverted back to the crown. Christina, then almost 50, retired to Nishapin Castle, where she raised her granddaughter Elizabeth. 
On December eighth, sixteen twenty-five, Christina passed away, fifty-two years old. She was buried in Strängnäs Cathedral next to her husband. Christina has often been vilified throughout history. She has been described as a stern and grim woman who ruled her duchy and her children with an iron fist. She has been mocked for her scantiness, but the fact is that her frugality made her duchy bloom, and she could lend large sums of money to the crown, and left a fortune behind. Christina was in many ways the exact opposite of her daughter-in-law, Maria Eleonora, but one common ground is the historic tarnishing of their character. But the criticism of Maria Eleonora has been the opposite of that of Christina. She was too extravagant, too emotional, and, according to the men of her time, incapable to rule. So, how did Maria Eleonora end up in Sweden? It was not uncomplicated, but Christina was, as we have seen, a woman with the will of steel, and she had her mind set on Maria Eleonora. Not because of her personally, but because she was from the Principality of Brandenburg, a neighbor to the Polish vassal state of Prussia. Sweden was at war with Poland, as we know, and an alliance with Brandenburg would thus be advantageous. But Bania Eleonora's parents, Johann Sigismund of Brandenburg and Anna of Prussia, had other plans. Despite this, Gustav II Adolf traveled to Brandenburg, where he met Anna and Maria Eleonora, who is said to have fallen head over heels with the young king. Moreover, Christina had worked under reluctant Anna, who eventually gave in and gave her support to the marriage. But at that time, Maria Eleonora's father had died, and her brother, George Wilhelm, had taken over, and he was completely against the match. So, in an almost coup-like fashion, Anna sailed with her daughter towards Sweden. To finance the journey, she simply marched into the treasury and grabbed a number of valuable items. On October 7, 1620, the almost 20-year-old Maria Eleonora arrived in Kalmar, where Gustav Adolf met her. The wedding was held at Stockholm on the 25th of November, and three days later, she was crowned queen. Maria Eleonora is said to have loved her husband very much. Too much, even. He was often absent in various wars, and then Maria Eleonora was in a state of despair and often sick with worry. When he returned home, she recovered and said herself that she was in heaven. When Gustav Adolf's younger brother Carl Philip died, there was no heir in case Gustav Adolf would die. And that risk was very real, since he almost always was at the front line in one of his many wars. Maria Eleonora must therefore early have felt the pressure to produce the longed-for heir, meaning a prince. And she quickly became pregnant. But her concerns for her husband's safety were so great, and when he left her to return to the front, she had a miscarriage the very same day. In 1623 she became pregnant again, and this time the king made sure to be home in time for the birth. Maria Eleonora gave birth to a daughter, Christina Augusta. It was not the prince they had hoped for, but the royal couple was said to be happy. But not even a year later, the child died. The next year, Maria Eleonora gave birth to a stillborn son. It must have been a hard time for the young queen, who lost three children and was in constant worry for her husband. Moreover, she did not feel at home in Stockholm, which was considerably smaller and poorer than Berlin, where she used to live. She also found the culture greatly neglected and she brought musicians, ballet masters, goldsmiths, and others who would brighten Swedish court. She was interested in architecture and had many plans to build beautiful palaces in the capital, but the treasury was all but empty. She hadn't received her dowry from Brandenburg either, so she took large loans to maintain a glamorous lifestyle and incurred huge debts. She has been strongly criticized for this, both in her own time and after, but the fact is that Maria Eleonora was in a difficult position. As queen, she was expected to surround herself with luxury and flair, and probably felt strongly pressured to do so, despite the lack of money. 
However, a glimmer of light appeared in the summer of 1626 when she got pregnant again. This time too, Gustav Adolf came home in time for the birth. On December 7th, the child was born, and it was a great joy. Finally, the queen had given birth to a prince. Or had she? When the child was born, it was covered head to knees in the fetal membrane and screamed with such strong voice that those present assumed that the child was a boy. The rumor spread. A prince was born. The cannons fired a salute. But when the child had been wiped clean, it turned out to be a girl. At first, no one dared to go and tell the king. It was his half-sister, Katarina, who eventually plucked up the courage and carried the girl to her father. But the fury everyone expected didn't come. Instead, Gustav Adolf supposedly laughed and said that she will grow cunning with time, for she has deceived us all, and proclaimed that he loved her as dearly as if she had been a son, at least according to Christina's autobiography. For the child was of course no other than the future Queen Christina, or King Christina, as she should be called, since she was later to be crowned king and not queen. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The Thirty Years' War, which had broken out in Europe in 1618, was a religious war that arose from the tensions the Reformation had brought. In 1630, it was decided that Sweden would join the war. There was worries that the war would eventually come to Sweden anyway, and it was better to fight abroad than at home. So, when little Christina was almost four years old, Gustav Adolf yet again rode to battle. The farewell between father and daughter was sorrowful, and Christina would later describe it as her strongest childhood memory. They would never see each other again. Maria Eleonora, on the other hand, inconsolable as usual when her husband was absent, would make sure they would meet again. When she couldn't make him come home, it was decided that she would travel to Germany to visit him. We can assume, even though Christina had hereditary rights and was Gustav Adolf's heir, it was still hoped that the queen would give birth to a son. So in July 1631, she left Sweden with a great company, and in January the next year, the royal couple could finally be reunited. The Swedish army had just won a great battle, and together they rode into Frankfurt am Main, where they were celebrated as rulers. Gustav Adolf was at the height of his career. In the beginning of March, he had assembled the largest army Europe had ever seen at that time, a hundred thousand men strong. It was yet again time to say goodbye. Maria Eleonora was so distraught that she threatened to go after him, even without an escort. The Chancellor, Axel Oxenstierna, was worried he couldn't keep her without her getting ill, and eventually she was allowed to follow her husband. On the 28th of October 1632, the royal couple met for the very last time. Already the next day, Gustav Adolf left again, and this time he would not return. On the 6th of November, he was killed in the Battle of Lützen. When the news reached the Queen, she fainted from the shock. And now, Maria Eleonora's problems would really begin. Little Christina was at this time only six years old, but would now become regent of the Swedish Empire. A regency council was appointed, and Maria Eleonora felt that she, just as her mother-in-law had been, should be a part of that council. But this, the council flatly refused. Maria Eleonora was not deemed suitable to run the country's affairs, and to support this view, the powerful lords had a letter from Gustav Adolf to the Chancellor Axel Oxenstierna, where he explicitly told him to keep the Queen outside any Regency Council. A many years long power struggle between the Dowager Queen and the Council began. Another reason for conflict were the issue of the King's funeral. Maria Eleonora refused for a long time to have him buried at all, since she wanted his body with her. When she eventually was pressured to allow a funeral, she demanded that his heart would be put in a separate box that she could carry with her. Her grief over her husband 
has historically been used to paint her as a hysterical widow on the brink of insanity. This view, however, has not taken into account that to bury the heart separately from the body was a common practice on the continent. So was also the custom to drape the rooms in black cloth to show grief, which he also did. What Swedish historians have seen as an expression of female hysteria was thus common practice in Maria Eleonora's homeland. But her reactions was not tolerated by her contemporaries either. The council feared that she would ruin the young Christina by keeping her with her in the dark and draped rooms. They also worried that she would poison the future monarch against them and against Sweden, which they accused Maria Eleonora of hating and despising. Eventually, the Regency Council went as far as to separate mother and daughter in 1636. Maria Eleonora was not only excluded from political power, but also from raising her only child. If she felt bitterness and resentment towards the council and the country, who can really blame her? For a few years, she tried to regain custody of her daughter, but eventually she gave up. She had had enough of the cold and hostile Sweden, and in 1640, she did something unbelievable. With help from the Danish ambassador, she secretly fled to Denmark. Her daughter Christina, now 14 years old, later wrote about how shocked both she and the council were at this. Even if the council may have thought it bit of a relief to be rid of the difficult dowager queen, it was still shocking and not a little embarrassing for them that she fled the country and to the Danish enemy at that. But Maria Eleonora's troubles were not over. Nobody really knew what to do with the fugitive queen. She wanted to go to Brandenburg, where her nephew, Frederick William, ruled. But she had no money, and the nephew was not really that thrilled to receive her. But eventually, she got on. A deal was made with the Swedish Regency Council, where she was granted financial support from Sweden. Although, this was not given directly to Maria Eleonora, but to her nephew, who in reality became her guardian. Another insult from the council. In 1644, her daughter Christina became of age, took over as regent and began working to get her mother home to Sweden again, despite some resistance from the Privy Council. The Dowager Queen and her escape was still a sensitive issue, but Christina argued that the monarch's mother could not be in exile, and in 1648, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden. Christina was careful to show her mother every courtesy, gave her castles and made sure she finally received her inheritance. Maybe their relationship wasn't an uncomplicated one. They had, after all, been separated for many years. But they shared a passion for theater and attended many shows together and visited each other often. In one area, Maria Eleonora and her old enemies in the Privy Council now agreed. Christina must get married. They had chosen her cousin Carl Gustav for her. But Christina, like her mother, was not that easily led. Instead, she made the council approve Carl Gustav as her heir, and on June 6, 1654, she abdicated the throne in favor of her cousin. Then she did what her mother had done many years ago and left the country. Maria Eleonora, though, remained behind and it is said that her daughter's abdication was a source of grief for her. We can only guess at her feelings when Christina converted to Catholicism, the very religion her beloved Gustav Adolf had died fighting. Maria Eleonora was overshadowed by the new royal family, Carl X Gustav and his new bride, Hedvig Eleonora. Her last official appearance was at their wedding in October 1654. On March the 18th, 1655, Maria Eleonora passed away at Stockholm Castle, 55 years old. She has been remembered as a hysterical widow, despondent with grief and incapable of taking care of her own daughter. This is an unfair image of her. She was a woman in a man's world who fought for her rights, for influence and economic resources, 
but lost the fight against the powerful noble men who ran the country. Her only child was taken from her, and instead of being a passive bystander, she chose to take her faith into her own hands and leave the country she felt so lonely in. Maria Eleonora was far from the fickle and volatile woman she has been portrayed as. With Christina's abdication, the kingship passed from the Vasa family to the Palantine family, in Sweden called the Fals dynasty. Maria Eleonora was thus the last of the Vasa queens, the women who had been by the Vasa king's sides through 130 years of power struggles, wars and bloody family feuds. They were not just wives and mothers, but power players in their own rights who made lasting impressions not just in their own time, but in Swedish and Nordic history.